Hello, and thank you for joining us today at this uh, online forest session called The Youth Voice. So we're going to be talking to some uh, British Columbia youths about their vision for the future. And uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We've got Katja Bannister and Jasmine Hashi. Am I saying that right? Hashe? Hashe. Hashe. Thanks, Jasmine. And Ellie Barnhart. Welcome, Ellie. And Sarah Bauman. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. So uh, some of you guys are in Cowichan Valley, Valley and Sarah's in Vancouver. So uh, you guys are people who have already been involved in environmental action and climate action. And that's why we invited you here today, because um, you guys are already involved. You're probably quite knowledgeable. You might even be more knowledgeable than a lot of adults. So uh, I'd like to um, we'll just go around and we'll do some Q&A and hear your opinions and hear what, how you've been active and talk about what you want for the future. So uh, I'll start by giving the bios for these very impressive young people. So we'll start with Katja. So Katja is a 17-year-old youth climate activist and community organizer from Thetis Island, BC. And she leads the Cowichan Valley Earth Guardians crew, which is a group of youth from Cowichan Valley who strive to create meaningful change involving social and environmental issues. She's in grade 12 at Queen Margaret School in Duncan and plans to pursue a career in ethnoecology. She has a passion for restoration and conservation work, poetry, blogging, and she's currently learning to speak. Oh my gosh, I can't say it. Katja, can you pipe in here and tell me how to pronounce that? Hulkaminum. Hulkaminum language. And her blog can be found at sowseedsofchange.wordpress.com, and I'll put a link to that. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, let's go to Jasmine. So Jasmine is a 16-year-old queer Métis climate activist, and she's been a member of the Cowichan Valley Earth Guardians since May of 2019. And she plans to become an Indigenous family support worker and cares deeply about social justice and climate justice issues. She is an activist because she has an understanding of the future she wants for herself and the people around her and the planet. Welcome, Jasmine. All right, let's go to Ellie. So Ellie is a student at Cowichan Secondary School and she's been an active member of Cowichan Valley Earth Guardians since September of 2019. And she's passionate about conservation, natural, natural resource protection, and the rights of the people. Welcome, Ellie. All right, let's go over to Sarah. Sarah Bauman is a grade 11 student living in Vancouver, and she's a member of Sustainability Teams, which is a youth movement from across Metro Vancouver, united to create a just and sustainable world. As well as being an activist with Sustainability Teams, She's also a new member of the British Columbia Sustainable Energy Association, and she leads the Our World Club, the Green Club, at her school. And she's passionate about making a difference in her community and about changing the world to become more sustainable. She hopes to transform her passion for the environment into a career in the near future, and for now, she continues to fight for climate justice in her community. Welcome, Sarah. All right, I'm quite in awe of the, uh, the bios here. I don't know if mine uh, comes close to comparing. So, so let's just go, we're gonna go around round robin style and I'll kind of go in the, the way that the pictures are on my screen. So let's start with Katja. Um, how, tell us how you got involved in environmental activism. Uh, so I think I probably first started considering my act, myself an activist um, since March of 2019, which was when I attended my first ever climate strike and which was one of the first days of youth climate action as a big thing, as something that had just emerged onto the scene. It was a big day, I think, for a lot of us. And I've talked to a lot of other people and I know that they feel that day was a catalyst for them as well. But um, even though I maybe wouldn't have uh, considered myself an activist, I've been caring for the earth for a very long time. And before I ever organized a community event or strike for my future, I was already doing restoration work and learning about ecology and forming the opinions I think that would 
form the foundation for the work that I'm doing right now. And after attending my first climate strike, I really started to feel this pull towards the world of actual activism and community organizing. And I decided to join my local youth organizing group, the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew. Beauty, well, thanks for that. Yeah, and it was sort of a similar transition for me. I was sort of living in connection with the natural environment. And then, um, well, actually I was slammed by the Grand Forks flood in 2018. And I realized there was big problems with forestry in BC. And, and then I uh, sort of, slid into activism. So yeah, so I think a lot of people who are um, getting into activism were already living, living the life, the connection with nature. So thanks for that, Katya. All right, Jasmine, tell us how you got involved in environmental activism. Okay, um, so I have always believed in the climate crisis and it never felt too distant or too far away from me. Um, as my mother who I would classify as a hippie. She would tell me all about global warming and even when I was quite small and I have memories of her not buying anything new for a whole year. Everything was used or hand-me-downs or like second hand. She didn't eat meat because of the environmental impacts and she took so many precautions and although I was like aware of the climate crisis and I myself also took precautions like thrift shopping and going vegan. I always felt like something would just fix it for me until early May of 2019 when a spike in youth climate activism happened. I realized that I was incredibly wrong and I was realizing the urgency. Um, and I just lost all the hope that I had for the earth. And I started to feel a constant, overwhelming sense of dread for our planet. So when I was introduced to the idea of climate striking, something just like clicked in me and I realized that I had it, I had to have a climate strike. So I organized one by myself um, and it took place on May 24th, 2019. Um, and it happened just outside my high school and we walked down to beside the highway where people were coming off of the Malahat, which is a mountain where you leave Victoria, which is like the big town close to us and um, people just like seemed very encouraging of us. So um, it just gave me a sense of hope. And then I realized like that's something that I had to keep doing. And I was introduced to the idea of the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians. And so I joined. Excellent, very well said. And, and I think that's part of what happens for many people is when we get involved in activism, we shift from a sense of hopelessness to a sense of hope. It, it helps us to feel more powerful when we get involved and, and we're doing something. Something. Thank you for that, Jasmine. All right, so Ellie, can you tell us how you got inv involved in environmental activism? My first, my first involvement with environmental activism was pretty unorthodox because it started as part of a, like, a ninth grade social studies project where we had to design a flyer for some kind of like global issue and I was like oh trees are cool I'll do something on trees and as I was looking into like forests and how to protect them and stuff old growth trees came up and I'm like well those seem very interesting I'll make my little brochure on that and through that little like mini campaign I did just in my classroom um, it was part of the Take a Stand project. Um, so I ended up making a connection with Alison Kermode from SFU. And I, it was me and two other people from, from like the West Van area. And we spoke to West Vancouver City Council about like logging on the back of Mount Cypress, I think it was. And um, like clear cutting and their specific regulations on like how big a tree has to be and stuff like that. Um, and so because, um, the person I was doing the project with totally slacked off, I got to go to West Vancouver and talk to the city council about trees. Um, and then that was like, it was that during school. And then like the summer, I didn't really do anything. And then I was introduced to Earth Guardians in like September. And then I've been a member since then. 
Cool. Thank you so much, Ellie. Yeah. And so uh, what I'm finding is that um, getting involved in activism, I have to brush up on my uh, public speaking skills. So uh, you got a little taste of that speaking to the council. Good for you. Excellent. All right, Sarah, tell us how you got involved with environmental activism. Yeah, sure. So for me, I've always, I wouldn't consider myself an activism forever, but um, I've always been interested in the environment and it really all started when I was really young and we were in Mexico and I got to release baby turtles into the wild um, as a way of um, advocating for conservation in that community. So from then it's sort of always been a part of me, animals, the environment, anything. And now I am involved in the Green Club at my school which I started doing last year. So that's kind of when it all took off for me. And just this June, I was introduced to sustainability. And so I'm rather a new member, but that's, I guess, when I would consider myself an environmental activist. Cool, very good. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's a very cool experience with the baby turtles. I'm jealous. <laughs> all right. so. Um, Katya, can you tell us what kinds of activities and events you've been involved in? And maybe you could, that could kind of segue into how your group got started and what kind of activity it's focused on. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, so I've been doing a variety of organizing work over the past year and a half, which is something that's pretty new to me, but I've been really loving it. And I think that's kind of where I found my little niche in the world. And some of it has focused more on um, building community and cultivating creativity. And examples of this include hosting sign painting parties for strikes and designing a youth-led community mural project. And other work has centered on uh, building relationships and making connections through activities such as hosting community engagement events and doing restoration and remediation and regeneration and permaculture work and petitioning and speaking at events, tabling, hosting webinars, almost every item I just said is something that I've only done because I started doing activism work. And it's just amazing to think back on about a year and a half of my life and how much newness has come from that and how much gratitude I have for all those experiences that are so new to me but feel so much a part of me now. And so um, just elaborated on what my organizing group does, but um, the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew began in 2017, I think in November, when our crew founder Sierra Robinson called a meeting in her living room and said it was time for youth, children, change makers of all ages in our community to step up and help create the future we want to see. And it's really amazing to see how our group has evolved since then. And since I'm in my uh, last year of high school, I will be leaving the couch and valley after this year so I can only um, just be excited and smile and be hopeful for what is next to come as leadership from me is passed on to someone else. Beauty, yeah, and I, I like the way that you spoke about relationships and community. I found that since I started be in advocacy and activism, those are, those are key things, so way to focus on that. All right, um, Jasmine, can you tell us some of the activities and events that you've been involved in? Um, a lot of the events and opportunities that I've had um, are like the same as Katia's and Ellie's because we are in the same groups, but um, I've had so many opportunities with the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians and I've attended like countless anti-pipeline rallies with Soatin Solidarity events. And I had the privilege to attend the occupation of the British Columbian for Ministry of Forestry and Mines with uh, many other Indigenous youth. Um, 
but I don't just go to protests. I also have been a part of planning climate strikes. Um, I've helped with CADIA with some community art events, um, done watershed restoration. And in June and July, I had the privilege to be a guest speaker slash educator with CADIA um, for a Vancouver Island University course called Teaching and Sustainability, where we talk to people in their second year of a bachelor's degree in education. Um, and then the next class, people getting their master's in education about um, youth climate activism. And it was really cool because the people getting their master's, a lot of them were teachers at my school at the time. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for that. And thanks for being involved in the planning stuff and not, not you know, it's important for people to show up to events and marches, but the planners are important too. <laughs> thanks, Jasmine. Ellie, tell us about some of the activities and events you've been involved in. Well, uh, like Jasmine said, a, there's a lot of overlap because of um, all the work we do together as like the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew and all the work we've done in the past. But um, I'm more on the social activism side than the climate activism side. So I do like, I don't know, I do enjoy um, going to restoration things and I really want to go to more because um, I haven't been to as many as everyone else in the crew, but I'm definitely more on the like community planning side. I really liked, um, we had an event that I can't stop singing the praises of, um, Youth Get Charged Up, and it was like um, a bunch of local organizations kind of meeting up and hosting a little festival advertising ourselves to each other, and you can go in and walk around the booths and see how you can get involved in our little community and it was really cool to see all of these like because it's such a small community on this small island you wouldn't think there would be so many organizations with so many like similar values and ways to take action but there is and we have this beautiful community um in the couch and valley of just our governments they like listen to us and they care and um they're our community, they listen to us and they care. And that's, I think the most important thing that I've done is organize community and talk to people. Yeah, that's very cool. And I love the way that you're focusing on that. So important. Uh, connections, absolutely. All right, Sarah, tell us about some of the activities and events that you've been involved in. Um, so I would say that my work started um, in grade seven when I had to do a project about anything. It was like um, a last year of grade seven project for the school. So I decided to organize my first beach cleanup with the city of Vancouver. So I reached out and got the materials. I got tongs and bags and everything that you needed. And I informed the city where it was happening. And I reached out to a whole bunch of people and I had a turnout of about 300 people, which I thought was pretty cool. And so that was when it started. So since then I was with the Green Club at my school where last year we did uh, some work with Meatless Mondays where everyone would have a no meat in their lunches and also no waste Wednesdays where everyone would try not use plastic bags and single use plastics. So that was our work, but it got on put on hold because of COVID. And one project I was working on was to unite different organizations across Vancouver to hold them accountable to reduce their carbon footprint. But I didn't get very far because COVID started. So I'm hoping to continue that this year. Um, so in COVID, I reached out to some organizations and now I'm a part of the British Columbia Sustainable Energy Association. So we're doing some work with sustainable entrepreneurs there and also sustainability teams. So I guess for sustainability teams, that's my main focus right now. I'm so happy and so grateful to be a part of that team. But if you don't know, they're a youth movement in Vancouver that are united by the urgency that they feel to stop climate change and fight for climate justice. So the, the, what we're focused on right now is um, related to the upcoming election. So we're working on finding um, young, powerful individuals that are of age to run for parliament and bringing them into the system and 
instead of persuading other MPs, we have our own voice. So we're in the process of finding people and getting them to step up and do their part. Wow, that's a whole variety of things you're involved in, Sarah. That's so impressive. And and I find it very inspirational that you are also getting involved in politics and uh, that, that you're not just standing on the side going, well, I'll just vote, right? You're getting directly involved. And, and that's, you know, there should be a lot more at, uh, adults involved in those ways. So thank you for that. All right, so let's start, talk a little bit about um, why the environment is important to you. Maybe I think I'm going to go in reverse this time. And Sarah, I know that you just talked, but let's start with you. Why, why is the environment important to you? For me, it's really a question of why it isn't important. I, I really can't name a reason for why the environment is not important and why conserving it is not important. I just can't. It's important to me because it has to be. If, if no one stands up for it, the ecosystem will die and it will take us with us. That is the sad reality of it. And I want a future just like other people, a lot of other people do. And I want a future where the humans and the earth and all of its creatures can live in harmony, not where humans are constantly taking advantage of the earth's resources. So we need to give back and restore a place where we can live sustainably and make a long-term solution for ever occurring problems. The environment is important to me because it's my duty as a human on the earth to protect it and to restore it. Long-term indeed, absolutely, yeah. And tell us, uh, what's your favorite place in nature to spend time? 100% the mountains. I've grown up skiing there since I was three, specifically Whistler Black Comb. So it's like my second home there. I, I love it so much. Sweet. Thank you. All right, Ellie, why is the environment important to you? The environment is important to me for the same reason that, like, parents protect their children, for the same reason that people care so much about their friends and their families. You can't separate people from their home. And the environment is just a really big home. It's just everybody's home. The ecosystem is just where we all live and I think that in order to achieve a like a just world you have to have a just climate you have to have people and our planet interconnected we have to work with the resources we have instead of against them like we have for so long we need to take only as much as we need and give back more than we can take and that's why um, regenerative and sustainable practices are so important because they ensure that our families and our friends and the people who come after us will have a world that they can love as just as much as we love our world now. A place where we all live, absolutely, yeah. And what's your favorite place in nature right now? My favorite place in nature is there's a um, there's a trail that runs kind of in my neighborhood-ish behind, like, the, like, I think it's behind Walmart, but there's a trail that runs past a marsh and kind of into a creek, and you can walk along the creek and along the marsh, and you can spot, like, herons there and, like, blue herons and a bunch of different types of bird, and the, um, the little creek area is also, like, a salmon habitat restoration so you can't go like onto the creek like onto the creek bed but you can see it right from the trail and it's it's just gorgeous and it's like a nice walk and in August there's thimbleberries all along the trail there and you can just pick them and like there's nothing cooler than free food especially if it's thimbleberries because they're very good. All right the irony, irony of finding something so beautiful you have to walk past a Walmart to get there hey. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ellie. All right, Jasmine, why is the environment important to you? Um, I was asked this question last September, I was realizing, by a local online newspaper. And so I decided to search it up and see like what I answered then and maybe I could reuse it. But I realized that my view has changed so much since then. And um, I, I see our, in my view of the planet, I see it 
as like the ultimate creator of life and to treat the environment so poorly is like kicking your mom on the floor until she bleeds and cries. And it's just like uh, stealing oil and cutting down the trees. And it's just the same as just treating it so awfully. Um, and I don't see the earth as my belonging. I see myself belonging to and with the earth. Um, it takes care of me and it teaches me and it feeds me. And I also recognize that it does this for everyone else, whether it be like a maggot or a clover or something as cognitive as a human. Um, these reasons make it hard for me to watch the destruction of the planet. Um, and even though I don't play the biggest role in this like abusive relationship we have with the earth, I see it as my responsibility to care for the environment, defend it and help nurture it back to health. I was incredibly eloquent. Thank you, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite place in nature to spend time? Um, that's kind of a weird question for me. I live in the suburbs of a rural town, so um, I'm just out of walking distance with most natural places. But without a doubt, I can definitely say my favorite natural place is like a, it's like a natural field that is near my house. And you have to go through a little hole in a fence and it has a little bridge over a ditch and everything to get in there. And uh, it's just really beautiful and you can see the sunset and the moon coming up. And in the spring, it's full of wildflowers, but in the fall and winter months, it's just disgustingly muddy. <laughs> Sweet, you might, well, at least part of the year, you have your little, your little piece of nature, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, thanks so much, Jasmine. Uh, Katya, what is, uh, why is the environment important to you? The environment is important to me because we as humans so easily forget that we are just an extension of it. I've heard like other people say that we need to learn how to coexist with nature or the environment as, as if we are separate from it, as if we are something else, as if we had alternative origin, but we don't need to learn how to coexist with nature or the environment. We are nature and we must relearn our existence. And it was, um, it was Thomas Berry who said, uh, the natural world is the larger sacred community to which we belong. To be alienated from this community is to become destitute in all that makes us human. To damage this community is to diminish our own existence. And that is exactly how I feel about this. And I really resonated with some of the things that were said already. And I think we're all very clear in this message is we are not separate. We are part of something much bigger and as humans who have kind of stepped out of the ecological role that we had evolved into and are quickly evolving out of, we need to learn how to manage that new role that has come onto us very quickly and that we haven't been able to figure out yet. This is all so new, all the cell phones and the giant cities and all these different things that have emerged in only a few hundreds of years. Whereas when we look at our history and we see how we fit into the natural landscape before, we had a very clear role where we were a part of something. It was reciprocal. There was interconnectedness and we need to get that back because that's so important. Absolutely. Determining our role. Um, and so what's your favorite place in nature? I have less of a favorite place and more of a feeling when I enter a space, if that makes sense. Maybe the feeling comes to me while I'm walking on the beach at low tide and I get squirted by one of the clams that are underneath the ground. Or maybe the feeling comes to me when I am out um, harvesting mushrooms and fungi with my mom and spreading spores. Or maybe the feeling comes to me when I'm in the forest 
just not with anything really in particular to do, but just breathing and feeling that air fill my lungs. So it's a feeling that comes from so many different things. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Thanks, Katya. All right, let's go to Jasmine. And the um, question we're going to address now is, um, what's your vision for the future of Earth? Big question. Yeah. Um, in reality, my vision for the future of the Earth, um, as it progresses, if it progresses how it is now, is not a very nice one, because I know that um, the, the planet will not be able to sustain our actions much longer. But if everything was how I wanted it to be, the world would run on renewable energy. Um, indigenous people would have full jurisdiction over their territories. Youth would be able to vote and universal basic income would be a reality. We would have no more billionaires. Um, but more specifically, the things that I want for the future of Vancouver Island and the Cowichan Valley are an end to urban sprawl, denser, more walkable communities with shared green places, free green transit for all, proper government funded restoration on all of our watersheds. Um, all of these things just serve so much purpose. Um, policies like universal basic income have been suggested to help mitigate the climate crisis and solve our issues with extreme poverty and unsafe labor. And Indigenous people having jurisdiction over their territories is not only morally right, but also Indigenous people already care for 80% of the world's biodiversity. Why shouldn't we let them have like all of this jurisdiction? jurisdiction, it will obviously help the environment. Um, all of these ideas aren't mine. They are just the bare minimum of what we need to do to save ourselves. And it's important to remember that when you talk about a feature of the earth, you have to remember that climate justice and social justice are intertwined and they cannot exist without each other. Excellent. Youth vote. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. All right, Sarah, um, what is your vision for the future of the earth? Yeah, so my vision is like, you know those utopian future movies where everything is just super innovative technology and there's just a whole lot of green everywhere? That's what I see because I believe that we can definitely turn this around. It may seem too late, but it's not too late. Everyone's saying, like I talk to my grandparents and I'm like, you should be more green. You should help more because I'm always trying to get them to reduce their carbon footprint, but they're still stuck in their old ways. But um, from that, it's just like those type of mindsets is what is holding us back. We need to have the mindsets that move us forward because if we do have the mindset of, oh, it's too late. We can't fix what we've done. The problem is too big the problem is too big then because we're not even willing to try. If we're not willing to reverse the damage that we've already done, then you're right. We're not going to have a world that looks like the utopian future movies. But if we can have the positive mindset and can do everything we can every day in our daily routines to fix what we've done, I do think that we have a great chance of a sustainable future. Excellent. Yeah. Mindset and possibility and potential. Nice. All right, Ellie, tell us about your vision for the future of Earth. I think my vision for the future of Earth is similar to Sarah's, where we don't tear down the infrastructure we already have and we don't, um, we don't reverse things, but instead repair them, where I think that cities can be green and still be cities. And I think that um, w renewable energy can run these cities and we can figure out ways to have our cake and eat it too. And of course, repairing this damage does come with some sacrifices. Of course, like changing your entire way of life away from the fossil fuel industry, which runs everything, and then switching it over to different renewable, um, renewable things, you know, different 
renewable and regenerative ways of generating energy, making things to use instead of plastic, and um, how to heat our homes, how to, you know, keep the lights on. We can still have lights and have a sustainable regenerative city. And I think that that would be like my dream vision for the future would be one where we can coexist with the technology we already have and the practices that help sustain communities here in the distant past. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So a sustainable earth doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to become a medieval peasant all of a sudden. We can uh, use technology wisely. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Ellie. All right, Katya, tell us about uh, your vision for the future of earth. Um, my vision for the future of earth is one of earth care, people care, and future care. And those are the three pillars of permaculture, which is something that I've gotten really involved in after working this summer at a youth run urban farm. And um, the f my vision for the future is one of intergenerational collaboration and inclusive communities and diverse representation. It is one of intersectional activism and justice. And with every action we take, activists and organizations and people you wouldn't even expect to be taking action. We are building and reaffirming our community and its resiliency and we are reaffirming these actions and these values. And I think that's definitely one of the most powerful things that we get to see as activists and as community organizers, us building community in a way that affirms these things and builds up towards a sustainable and regenerative future. Nice, absolutely. All right, well, I don't know about anybody else watching, but I'm getting chills right now, but it's, it's really great what I'm hearing. Okay, so what I would, what I'm really curious to hear from you guys, um, we're all female here, and what are, who are some of the women that inspire you and why? Let's start, let's start with Katya this time. When I saw this question um, as one that you had shared with us previously, and I thought about my answer, I just had so much to say and there was so many names that came to mind and it was so hard to put notes for myself that limited myself down to four and I'll try to share them as quickly as I can but I am inspired by so many of the women in my life and I feel so grateful to be surrounded by them. Among the women I most greatly admire is um, my mom, ethno ethnobotanist Dr. Kelly Bannister who does amazing work in ecological governance and applied research ethics. Um, my mom's work has focused on the role of governance tools and processes to address power relations and um, facilitate equitable research practices and collaborative research. And uh, among one of the one of the other women that I most admire is uh, my mom's mentor, ethnobotanist uh, Dr. Nancy Turner, who has been incredibly influential in the field of ethnobotany and has been working to help Indigenous communities document um, and promote their traditional knowledge of plants and habitats. And I think just just looking at Nancy and then my mom and then myself and seeing this love and knowledge of ethnobotany being passed on through generations of people is just so fascinating to me and I love seeing the two of them together and seeing how they bounce off the, this each other because although Nancy is my mom's mentor um, they just they're so distinct and they complement each other so well so it's so neat to see women like that at work and um, I, I also really admire um, my friends Nikki Wright and Genevieve Singleton. Nikki is um, the executive director of the Sea Change Marine Conservation Society and does amazing eelgrass restoration work. And me and Jasmine actually got to go see her um, 
I think last weekend and do some eelgrass restoration with her. I hadn't seen her in forever. It had been so long since I got to put my hands on some eelgrass shoots and that was just an amazing experience. And so she works a lot with coastal communities to do important eelgrass restoration and continue a long-term strategy of public education, monitoring, um, mapping, um, and restoration of eelgrass and other critical habitats within the near shore ecosystem. And um, Genevieve Singleton, who I mentioned before, is an inspiring activist, biologist, and Hokuminum language speaker. And so uh, it was mentioned earlier, but um, Hokuminum is the indigenous dialect from around the Kawachin Valley. And um, it is partly because of Genevieve that I have been so inspired to learn about uh, linguistics in general, but also about Hokuminum. And um, I know I just talked a lot there, but these women are so amazing and so important in my life and their work and the work of so many others has inspired me to do the work that I'm doing and given me such a strong foundation of passion and justice to stand on. And it is the work of past generations of activists that make the work that youth climate activists are doing today possible in a way as we stand on the foundation that they've laid for us. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. And Dr. Nancy Turner is one of the guests in our summit. Uh, we've already recorded her session and it was really quite amazing. And uh, one of the goals of, of our summit, one of the things that we're moving towards is to try and uh, allow communities to have more power, to have more say in what's happening in the, the land and the forests around them, because we're the ones that are being impacted directly by those decisions. And so it sounds like uh, Dr. Kelly Bannister, your mom might be somebody that uh, I would be good for me to talk to. So I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you about that later. All right, Ellie, so talk to us about some of the women who've been inspiring to you. Um, see, this question is always a bit hard for me, just like role models in general, because I don't really have role models. I kind of pick and choose things from all different people, but I do know that I am so grateful to be a part of the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew and because we only have one male member right now, which which we're trying to get more, I it's just, you know, it's I think we've kind of condensed into our very core of like members just because of COVID. There's not a lot of new people coming in, not a lot of new stuff we're working on. Um, but that's what we're doing at our next meeting. We're looking forward on like our next projects and stuff. But I think I mostly just really value the women around me in my real life. I really value Katya facilitating meetings and teaching me new stuff all the time. I value Jasmine and her work and seeing stuff on her Instagram stories and like, wow, she's doing such amazing work. And I value other Earth Guardians members and I value the people we work with and the other organize organizations we work with. I, um, I don't know. I don't have any specific like female role models and it's not like I can just, you know, rattle off every single woman in my life, but I do appreciate every single woman in my life and all the different values that they bring and the different things that they've all taught me. I appreciate that perspective, Ellie. Thanks so much for sharing that. All right, Sarah, can you tell us about some inspiring women uh, that you've been motivated by? Yes. So like Katya said, my mom is definitely my major role model in my life. Um, she's so supportive of what I do and she's just changed her life so much around what I do because I'm so involved in the environment. She's um, adapted her ways, even the small things like we use beeswax wraps, not saran wrap or like reusable fabric bags not ziplock just like small things or she bikes to work instead of taking the car just little things like that have just shown me how in amazingly supportive that she is for me and just having that huge pillar of support has made a huge difference in my life very cool i'm kind of jealous i wish she was my mom Okay, Jasmine, can you tell us about some women 
who inspired you? Um, yeah, I definitely can. Um, I have two that are definitely two of my biggest inspirations. Um, I'm heavily inspired by the Indigenous land defender, Siam Hamilton. Uh, she is a key part in the Indigenous justice organizing community that happens in so-called Victoria. I've met Siam on a few occasions and they're truly something else. She is so articulate, so powerful, so community driven. Um, when we were being circled by police during an occupation of the BC Ministry of Forestry and Mines, Siam just hugged me and explained to the officers why we were there. Um, they're also very active on social media. They spread information about decolonization, police violence towards uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and intersectional climate justice. And I just have so much to learn from them. Um, I also find myself often in awe of Autumn Peltier, who is my age, but also the Chief Water Commissioner for the Abishna Nation. And she speaks out about the climate crisis, the indigenous water crisis, and so many other topics. And she is also such, such an inspiration for people, um, young indigenous people. Excellent, thanks Jasmine. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought in the indigenous women uh, that are inspiring to you. Okay, so we've, let's go through two more questions. Um, we will let me pull up the questions here. So this is something that, this is a question I was actually inspired by something that Katya wrote on her blog to ask you. Um, what kinds of things are you seeing adults doing and not doing in regards to the environment that frustrates you? So let's start with Katya on this one. Obviously, you know, I already have a lot to say about this one, but I'm um, trying to air it down. Um, there, there are obviously so many frustrations that youth, and I'm sure all of us on this panel will understand some of those frustrations, um, have with government inaction in particular. And I, I do hold these frustrations, but my biggest frustration actually comes from adults not understanding the importance of language when bridging the generation gap on the topic of climate change and many other topics as well. And so often enough, adults will say things like, I guess we've screwed up the world and now it's your job to fix it. And I can almost quote people on that. So many different renditions of that have been said to me. And I hate it. This passing of the blame for the climate crisis from generation to generation really has to stop. It is imperative that adults create spaces that allow for the input of youth. And it is unfair to place the really, truly hefty burden of finding solutions to global injustices on the shoulders of youth. While it is the the majority of teenagers that I know want to be a part of a societal shift for global justice. It is not realistic for older generations to expect that this shift is the responsibility of today's youth, whom have had the least to do with the creation of these injustices. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there are adults who just seem to want to use divisory language and perpetuate untrue stereotypes about youth, such as teenagers are lazy and teenagers don't want to go to school and teenagers just want to drink and have a good time. But what is really important to me is that we focus on cultivating a culture of intergenerational collaboration that includes diverse people in decision making. And this all begins with using inclusive language that doesn't perpetuate age-based stereotypes and doesn't try to shift the blame from generation to generation. The time for action is right now, it was 10 years ago, it was 20 years ago, it's now. Now is our last chance. And to be able 
to take that chance and for us to be able to make real change, that means coming together and bridging those gaps and being inclusive and having diverse people sitting at the table saying what needs to be said and having us all represented in solutions. Here, here. Well said. All right, so let's go to Sarah. What are the kinds of things that you see adults doing and not doing in regards to the environment that frustrate you? So I touched on this a little bit before, but my family has never really been very environmentally conscious. And this has been a big part of fostering why I connect so much to the environment is because of their non-believing and because of their shunning, so to say. So when I go to my grandparents' house, it's just not something that is on their mind. It's always on my mind. So it's just a huge difference in the generation. So they get water delivered to their house in these humongous plastic jugs, or they use paper napkins and paper plates instead of just regular dishes or just all of these different things. Like they don't bring a water bottle and they buy one time and time again. And it's just all of these little actions that just add up. And so many people in our society are like this. It's just easier and more convenient for them to buy something single use or buy something that's not reusable instead of saving money, A, and B, doing something better for the environment. And it's just that lazy mindset that drives me nuts. Like, just just save money and save the environment at the same time. It, it goes hand in hand and it's better for you. It's not all of the blame, like Katya said, is not on us because we just were brought into this world. But there are so many people that have been here way longer than us. They should know by now that that is what has to be done. It's as simple as that. It's that simple mindset of not throwing something away, but keeping it and reusing it or not throwing away your paper cup into the garbage because the recycling is a block down the street instead. Just taking that extra step and going the extra mile to do something better for the environment and for yourself. Yeah, uh, water, single use water bottles are my pet peeve too. And we never had those when I was growing up when, you know, I was born in 1967 and I don't remember seeing any stinking single use water bottles until the 90s. And I was like, we were all like, we were all like, what's going on? What, what is up with this? So yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. Jasmine, can you tell us what are some of the things that you see adults doing and not doing in regards to the environment that frustrate you? Uh, I think that my answer is very, very similar to Katia's answer as I spend a lot of time talking to her. My neighbors are on their trampoline. Um, um, we can't hear your neighbors. I'm, I'm nervous because okay. my dog is snoring and I'm like, oh, can everybody hear him? We can't okay. hear your family neighbors. Okay. Um, it's, it is very impossible not to notice that all oil companies, forestry companies, and corporations like Amazon, Coca-Cola, and Unilever are all owned by adults. Um, and I see a lot of climate denial in adults that I think comes from a sense of guilt and they know that it is a problem and they know that they are the ones that contributed to it. Um, but they feel so bad about it that they just keep denying. Um, I also try to strive for intergenerational collaboration and it is hard to foster when adults that like do believe in the climate crisis and have good intentions say things like that they trust the youth will fix it and they compare us all to Greta Thunberg, which is nice, but it puts a lot of responsibility on us to solve this crisis on our own. When we don't have the funds, the ability to vote, and we aren't the ones investing in fossil fuels. Um, I just want adults to start taking more responsibility and remember that the journey towards climate justice is one that they um, that they have to participate in, not just support. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Jasmine. Good points. Ellie, can you tell us some of the things you see adults doing and not doing in regards to the environment that 
frustrate you? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that frustrates me the most is when, um, is when we as like youth activists are being like talked over. I think that, um, I don't know, I don't want to say ageism, but ageism, <laughs> ageism is a huge problem in like wanting to foster intergenerational collaboration is really difficult when you're being constantly discredited because you're just a kid. And I think that part of that mindset that needs to change is that even just a kid can reduce their own personal footprint, you know? And there's the the divide between like, what can we all do individually? Like um, using beeswax wraps instead of, um, instead of plastic wrap, like Sarah said, and not using single use um, plastic bottles. But, you know, I think it was something like 80% of the plastic in the ocean is fishing nets. And so it, it puts in perspective how much is one person's um, how much is one person going to change anything or how much is every person going to change anything when a lot of these up like these um, recurring issues in climate justice are could be dealt with at a political level by having stricter fishing regulations for example in that one case you find that a lot of the um, a lot of the dumping of garbage isn't personal garbage it's corporations getting rid of the stuff they don't need to make their product and I think that having stricter regulations on what corporations, because when you think about corporations and corporate factories, they make so much stuff. I cannot picture every current, like every Coca-Cola bottle that exists in the world right now, I, I can't picture it. There is no room big enough because you think about the storerooms of every single Walmart and every single place. How many bottles is that? So. I think that's why when um, when like plastic water bottle companies are like, oh, we made our caps 25% smaller, that actually does have a massive effect. Is it enough? Probably not. But it does have a massive effect when you consider the scale of things. And I think that whole spiel is why it makes me so frustrated that I can't vote. Because all of this stuff, we could just make it illegal. Like we, governments have the power to make stuff like that illegal. Like it's just illegal to make, um, to use this kind of material now. They can do that, but they choose not to because they profit from it. And I think that's the most disheartening part is that adults aren't aware of that. And because we kids are aware of it, it doesn't matter. Cause all we can do is tell adults who ignore us or not vote because we can't vote. And that's the most frustrating thing, I think, is how much the blame is put on individuals when a lot of it is corporate. Yeah, good point. All right, so we've got about four minutes left. So we'll finish with a question about forestry. And if, if you could, I know it's not a lot of time, it's a big question, but if you could each spend about a minute talking about, if you could make, wave a magic wand, what would the BC forests look like now and into the future? Let's start with Jasmine this time. Um, if I had a magic wand, BC forests would look the way they did before we had our first interaction with the European colonizers. Um, trees would be interacted with in a way that treats them with dignity and respect. They would be asked if they wanted to be used. They would be thanked. Clear cutting would be a foreign word, but realistically, um, I can't just make the trees all come back and rip down all of the infrastructure that we have. If I had a magic wand, I would end logging of old growth forests. Um, I would help encourage and start food forests for our communities so we can eat more locally and rely um, on a local food chain. Um, everyone would recognize that we are not entitled to cut down our forests for industrial uses as that only brings greed, unfair labor, and a lack of biodiversity. I think a key point for me is that I want everyone to understand that forests don't belong to us. Forests belong to the forests and the animals and plants that grow and live there. 
Excellent, thank you so much, Jasmine. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us if you could ma wave a magic wand, what would BC Forest look like now and into the future? For me, I would say if I had a magic wand, I would discover a new material to replace wood so that they would not feel the need to log anymore because I think it's unrealistic not to log at all because it, wood is such a huge part of our industry and our infrastructure. And I know that's not a good thing, but it's, it's there and it's a part of, I don't think any building I've ever been into doesn't have a part of it that's wood. So I would invent or discover a new material that could replace it so we could not feel the need to cut down the forest anymore. There we go. Great idea. Thank you so much, Sarah. Ellie, if you could wave a magic wand, what would forests in BC look like now and into the future? Um, okay. So first of all, um, magic wand of like decolonization, not like in the past, but now where I would um, sort of like give back um, power over like control over the forest to um, indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. So each respective indigenous community would be in control of who gets to or who doesn't get to log each forest um, or, you know, take resources from each forest. Um, and I think that because different indigenous groups have different um, governments, um, like that's just how it would be is every, um, you would live under their rules, so to speak, but because so many of them, I think almost all of them are like democratic, you would still have a say and it's like, you'd still live here. They're not kicking you out. They're just changing the way things sort of happen. And I really like that idea. That sounds really cool. And I would want, um, you know, I would want the use it or lose it policy to be completely destroyed and I would make it so, um, Anyone could, um, like, rich people who want to be philanthropists could buy a plot of land and just save it for conservation reasons, because I know we can't do that now. I would um, protect old growth trees and um, create, like, second growth um, logging systems where we'd regrow and then take a layer, and then as it grew, we'd take the back layer and kind of go in a way where we have specific plots of land, like, for logging, and that we wouldn't just log everywhere. Um, and I think that's the most important part is you can't just take down all the trees and plant new trees. One, because of time. Two, because the longer a tree is, the better it is at its job. And that's why protecting old growth is so important. They store more carbon. They can fall into really good nurse logs for the rest of the forest. And they're just really, really important. You know, um, you just got to see it like the older they are, the better they are at what they do. Um, which is why I promote like second growth um, blogging. Great, good idea. Well researched as well. Thank you for that. Katio, if you could wave a magic wand, uh, what is your vision for BC Forests now and into the future? I think I share a sentiment with everyone else when I say that as much as I'd love to, I, I can't wave a magic wand and I don't really want to think about it because I want to invest in the reality of our now and the serious work that needs to be done to protect and restore our forests and watersheds. And that can mean thinking about uh, urban agriculture and food forests in communities so that we don't feel the need to be cutting down forests to make way for agriculture pursuits or same with industry and um, housing and building out our cities. If we can think of better ways to build and better ways to provide for our communities, then we won't need to keep cutting, to keep building, to keep perpetuating these systems that don't actually support us as well as we'd like to think they do. And it can mean restoration and regeneration and remediation work where we are going out and we are being in those natural spaces, in natural spaces that have been degraded by um, 
government action and by industry and actively being a part of the restoration of those spaces and seeing them come back to life. I know that has been really powerful for me in my life. And it can also mean pushing to create legislation that protects our forests and our watersheds and all these different spaces. Action can come from so many different places and it will take all of us doing our part to stand up to those in power and use the power of the people to create real change. And it will also take all of us who are white settlers listening to indigenous people and actively creating opportunities for indigenous knowledge and stewardship to play a key role in the protection and stewardship of their sacred places. Excellent, yeah, the real hard work and everyone getting involved so uh, I've had chills many times throughout this conversation with you guys. Uh, I'm incredibly inspired and um, impressed by your um, articulate answers and your eloquence and your understanding of the issues and your involvement and your dedication. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, I hope to keep in touch with all of you in the future. And, and I'm, I know that I'm, a lot of people are gonna be inspired by, by this, uh, this session in our summit. So, Thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to, to more conversations in the future. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much.